our uh, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous speaker tonight is Farah Pandith. She is an author, a foreign policy strategist, and a former diplomat. Uh, she is a world-leading expert and pioneer in countering violent extremism. She's a frequent media commentator and public speaker. Her amazing book, which I encourage you all to read as I did, is entitled How We Win, How Cutting-Edge Entrepreneurs, Political Visionaries, Enlightened Business Leaders, and Social Media Mavens Can Defeat the Extremist Threat. Uh, if you uh, look at some of her things that are online, uh, she had a great article um, from the end of 2021 in The Economist, which uh, really packed the punch and was very impactful for me. She served as a political appointee under Presidents George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. And I'm, I feel kind of odd saying it, but what that means is she's the real deal because when you are selected to serve at a high level by uh, the administrations of the different parties, it means your judgment and expertise is uh, valued at an incredible level. Um, most recently, she was the first ever special representative to the Muslim communities, serving both Secretaries Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. She has served on the National Security Council at the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Agency for International Development in various senior roles. She is a senior fellow with the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School as well as an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. In the fall of 2020, the Muhammad Ali Center named her the first ever Muhammad Ali Global Peace Laureate for her proven track record of and commitment to promoting diversity, cohesion, and respect. Ladies and gentlemen, Farah Pandith. Thank you for coming here. It Good is pleasure. marvelous to meet you in person. What is something, the most important thing, that you would like our audience who are very interested in what you do to know tonight? That the solutions are available and affordable right now to stop the growth of hate in our country and around the world. Please tell us about the hate. It is no surprise to anybody in this room that we're witnessing an extraordinary moment in time uh, hate is not new. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've seen it in various forms. We've seen violent extremism in various forms. We fought it in different times in US history. Um, but we are seeing something truly frightening at this moment. We're seeing um, several layers of complexity that are joining together to make this a very volatile moment. What are those layers? We have um, old systems of hatred that exist in our country that are funded at a level that we haven't seen in a very long time. We see organization of hate groups uh, organizing in new ways, online and offline. We see an acceleration of technology which makes it easy with a swish of your finger to connect to people who are like-minded. Uh, we're seeing a change in the landscape of what we think we should tolerate in America uh, and the world. So the red lines have shifted. In a post 9-11 context, we're looking at the issues of hate and extremism in a very different way because we've seen a very uh, unprecedented type of non-state actor do what they did on September 11th, 2001. And for the last 21 years, we were primarily looking at the growth of the hate industry and violent extremist industry from groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the Taliban, and so our mind has been around that. I wish I could say that that was the only type of hate that was growing. Unfortunately, we all witnessed and are witnessing what's happening in our country too. So we have those type of extremist groups alongside ancient and old systems in America that have been ripened and are ready for action and are actually doing harm. So we have all of these types of hate groups that are mobilized in this way. So today, when we look at the landscape, it's far more critical that every American look at this as something that they need to take stock of and do something about and not think about it as being a threat far away from us uh, something that won't reach our shores because we all understand 
how different our country is today than it was several years ago. And we know that all of these hate groups cannot exist if they are not organized and if they are not funded and if they, importantly, don't have recruits. So when I look at um, the landscape, I'm, uh, you know, I'm really concerned that we aren't looking at this from the perspective of this is going to get worse, not just simply, oh, wow, there's a change. It's not going to stay like this. It's going to grow even scarier. So that's what we're looking at today. How is it going to get worse? Well, I have, uh, you know, as you have, uh, understood very importantly that when you are looking at forecasting and looking at the dimensions of a threat, you think about the scenarios and what's needed for an adversary to do their work. Um, is the money drying up? No, it's not drying up. Are there potential soldiers? Yes, there are. Um, are people getting radicalized at younger and younger rates? Yes, they are. So we're not talking about people who are generations um, you know, that are uh, in their 40s or 50s or 60s. We're talking about people as young as seven and eight and nine years old who are being recruited by far-right supremacy groups at this moment in time. So think about the span of the demographic of people that are potentially going to be activated. So when I think about the future, I'm thinking about the size of the armies, the hate armies. I'm thinking about the spread of the money uh, for those folks to get funding to do the training and to, to do all the things that they do. But I'm also looking at dimensions that really have been uncommon to the conversation. And what do I mean by that? There are, are certainly in some of the, the mindsets of people as they think about hate and extremism, they think that they've profiled what somebody who is an extremist looks like. They think they know. And so suddenly people are frightened and surprised when they see that people are buying into the QAnon conspiracy theory, for example, people who don't look any different than they do. Um, suddenly they're, they're surprised when they see that people at their family dining room table are suddenly going down a particular rabbit hole that they didn't think anybody in our family could ever do. So we have to think differently about the, the mindset that's happening um, in our country around who is being affected by ideologies of us versus them. And we need to be serious about what we do to inoculate communities from the threat of hate and extremism. How are these communities inoculated? How can that be done? One of the things that I've been working on since 9-11 um, has been how do you use non kinetic power, so non-hard power, not, not warfare, but a different type of warfare, ideological warfare. How can we think about um, making sure that someone doesn't get radicalized? What do we need to be looking at in a community, in a society? And over the course of the last two decades since 9-11, our country and countries around the world have in fact piloted programs that offer us potential solutions that if done at scale can really make a difference and change a community. So it's not a one size fits all, it's looking at many touch points in a community to nudge people along a particular way, to, to remind them that you can be, you can be opposed to somebody's um, thought process or what they stand for, but you don't have to be violent about it. That we as society can go back to red lines around what we think is acceptable beha human behavior, how we treat one another. Um, we can think about education materials. We can think about influencers in our community differently. At one point, we might think, oh, these are faith leaders. At one point, we might think these are teachers. At one point, we might think these are mayors. At another point, we might think it's the president. But it's not one or another. It is every, every constituency in our country needs to have people that are credible and authentic to them that are saying that hate is not OK, that violence in the name of what you believe is not OK. And that means a, a real shift in how we think about who's using um, their megaphone to activate changes in their community. And, um, and I know, because we've tested things, that it's as different as a 
a musician and an artist, as well as an entrepreneur or a business person. It depends on the community that you're trying to affect. If the extremists are kind of living, I'm thinking more of a elect, uh, online thing in a stovepipe world, how do you penetrate that? Well, one of the things I want to be clear about is that we tend to blame technology for everything. Like if we didn't have this, we wouldn't have this problem. Let's rem let, and I have a lot to say about technology companies. If somebody wants to ask those questions, I'm very happy to go deep on this. However, nothing happens in an online space that doesn't first happen in an offline space. Something is happening to you, inside of you. You're asking questions about yourself that you then go online to get answers to. You're curious. And on the kinds of extremism that I've spent the majority of my career working on, those um, non-state actors that will use the name of Islam for their nefarious means, they are, they are preying upon people who have a cultural affinity um, to Islam, okay? And so one of the first things we learned when we were right after 9-11 era, who are the people who are joining Al-Qaeda? Right. You know, who are these people? We had false pretenses. We thought they have to be really uneducated. We thought um, they had to be really poor. Certainly anybody who's educated and wealthy couldn't possibly do something like this. But it turns out that's not true. What's actually happening? Something's happening inside of these folks. They're deciding, I wanna, I wanna, understand my identity in a different kind of way. I want to think differently about belonging. So identity and belonging are central components to who you are, obviously, and who you want to belong to. It's the same thing with white supremacists. It's the same thing with other extremist groups that will say, in order for you to be authentic and real, you need to be like this. You need to dress like this, you need to act like this, you need to work like this. So how does that connect to the online space? When you have a question about wanting to belong, you're going into these online channels to be able to find people who are like you, who buy into what you think you want. And suddenly, what they're saying to you makes sense. And the more you think it makes sense, the more the algorithms online move you to people who, you, who they say you want to know. And the more you do that, you suddenly are going down a rabbit hole, and the only people that you are experiencing online are like-minded like you, and if you have an ideology that is horrific, and you believe that there's only one kind of human that deserves attention, you're in that pool, you're in that pool of people who believe that too. So it's dangerous, and we have no guardrails in place online to help us um, move back from the edge, which is why we're in, frankly, the situation that we are in today. Pulling back from the online world into the wake up every morning, what's my job world, both in America and let's say in the Middle East, let's take a young man who has gone to the university and he's gotten his degree and now there's no job. Or in America, there's somebody who thinks, you know, I thought I was gonna have a life like this and now I don't because the manufacturing plant I was expecting to work in is not here anymore. How do we address that? So one of the things that we all know is that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of people for whom that is a reality, and they don't become violent, and they don't become hateful, and they are, they are, they are containing how they think about the world in a particular way because that is the way either they were raised or their faith tells them that or the people around them and their family, those are their characteristics and values that are around them. There are people for whom that story means that they are angry and that they want to find people who can blame, who can say that there's a reason why those people are taking their jobs or um, they're the wrong religion and they brought all this stuff to our country. You can always find that, which is why you know, there are lessons to be learned about how hate groups in our country actually have been able to thrive. There's always the blame game. But I wanna go back to the sort of the family unit and I wanna go back to sort of a neighborhood. I mean, our neighborhoods. It's really hard to boil our, like, to think, oh my God, we've gotta fix America. I want you to think about fixing, if that's the right word, or addressing or reactivating your neighborhood. Because it's, our communities are made up of neighborhoods and how we think about things. So the value sets that we put forward um, can either move us in a direction of 
anger and blame and hostility and doing anything in the name of violence or being angry at some policies or being angry at a situation, but understanding that, there are, that, that the way forward is not to join um, the KKK or join ISIS to be able to do it. And then there's one other thing. The example that you used, Steve, was a young man. And I want to just say to you, it could be a young woman. And I say that because when we were looking at um, potential, the t potential path of these extremist groups, we've only been looking at men. For a long time, we were only looking at men, which I went to Smith. I'm a proud Smithy, so I, I'm going to say this. As usual, <laughs> we were only looking at the guy side. But it turns out that women are human too, and they can be radicalized. And so when we're looking at the threat sequence of what's coming, it isn't just the demographic piece around age, it's also the demographic piece around gender. And you will see, for example, for those of you who've been watching, um, the impact of all the kinds of groups that attacked our capital on January the 6th, that a lot of instigators were indeed female. Um, and that a lot of activation on some of the ideologies, like QAnon, come from women themselves who are radicalizing and moving people in a particular way. The same thing has been happening um, in some of the, the, the ISIS story. ISIS um, is important for our conversation here in the United States because while we aren't dealing with a threat from ISIS, many of the organizations that have organized themselves and are building their momentum are learning from a playbook of a very successful model. And ISIS was, in fact, a very successful model. So who are the people that got radicalized? How were they brought in? What is the difference between how men and women get radicalized at different points in their life? What's actually happening um, to the young children who have a mother, for example, who is very, um, who might be radicalized or have very strident toward the us versus them. A child, is, the first teacher for a child is its mother for the most part. And there we need to be really conscious of the fact that as we think about solutions here, what do we do, that we're looking at this very nuanced set of, uh, of, of ways of looking at things and not just saying we only need to educate, we only need to make sure that people are doing this and this and this. We need to think about the differences in the human mind as somebody matures through adolescence and young adulthood. We need to think about the differences of gender. And we need to think about um, not just the ideology, but how we activate communities and neighborhoods to, to absorb the fact that the threat matrix today is not the way it was you know, 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 30 years ago, we are looking at uh, a very different and complex set of factors that can move communities forward in a very different way. So let's say with the ISIS uh, approach, uh, in that mix are religion, our culture, yeah. our nationality, um, all the other things you talked about, um, that's a lot of issues. How do you address that? Well, think about it. If you're a recruiter, what you're doing is you're trying to figure out, first you want to build an army, and you need a bunch of people who are going to buy into your ideology. And if we go back to what I said about ID, uh, identity and belonging, ISIS recruiters were not recruiting en masse. They didn't get 10,000 people in a room and say, everybody stand up and now you are part of ISIS. They were recruiting through uh, videos, through sermons, through activated... Um, please, really, on trying to sell their ideology to people. And so the way they did that was very different, but it was all about making these young people believe that the only way to be Muslim was to do exactly what it is that they said, that everything else was wrong, that Islam is a monolith, and their way is the right way. Well, we all know that Islam is not a monolith. It's been on planet Earth for almost 1,400 years. It's extremely diverse. People... Um, you know, practice the religion in many different ways. They dress in many different ways. Um, and, but what ISIS was able to do was able to say, you in Oregon, and you in Berlin, and you in Tunis, and you in Jakarta, don't you all feel like you're not real Muslims? Come on over to our so-called caliphate, and we're going to make it, you know, a utopia. We're going to show you the way it's supposed to be. And so they were able to do, make bespoke pleas 
to the person in Jakarta and the person in Berlin and the person in Portland and say, use particular language, slang, the things that they like to recruit, and you recruit one-on-one. -on -one. So if I'm trying to recruit you, I'm gonna very, do it very differently than I would do it to you. I'd find a common way of relating to you. This model is being used by white supremacists as well. Um, they're not recruiting en masse um, you know, uh, across our country. They're doing it in very particular ways, um, and it is a very dangerous thing to, to see the ripening of this situation in this way. Coming back to the United States, since you mentioned the white supremacist menace, other than the word everybody, whose job is it to address that? It's everyone's job. Yeah. It takes all of us. And I want to be really clear about this. Blaming one sector or another sector is not the way out of this. I think all of us need to think about who we are and what we do every single day how you treat other people, how you teach your children, how you, teach your, how, you, how you live your life. Are you living by the values that you want to, to show that is not an us versus them? And I mean in everything. I mean in class, um, what strata of demographic you come from, uh, what your gender might be, what your sexuality might be, what your race and heritage might be. It's the way in which we think about this. But having said that, there's some really important sectors that have to play a very big and outsized role because of direction. One of those is government, obviously. And we have spent in my, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you heard a little bit of my bio, so I'm not coming at this from a partisan point of view. We have spent so little money across administrations on soft power, it is outrageous. And I'm gonna give you a stat that is gonna surprise you. So when we were fighting ISIS, in the, in the peak of fighting ISIS, we were putting a lot of money, as you all know, into that war. How much money do you think we spent on the soft power dimension of that, that pot of money? What percentage of that did we spend on the prevention of people getting radicalized? Give me a number. 0.0138%. Of that pot of money. And I'm saying this, Steve, because we cannot expect to see change if the government doesn't say this is important. It's changing the fabric of our societies here at home and abroad. Be, I started off by saying that solutions are available and affordable, and I mean it. If it's not, we're not dealing with, thank goodness, we're not dealing with something we have no idea how to deal with. Right? It's not some new cancer that's arrived and we don't have any vaccine, or yeah, I should say a, a COVID uh, you know, kind of situation where for, for the first part of it, we, had not, we didn't know what to do. We know what works. What we, the reason why we have failed is we haven't scaled. So I would say government has to get serious about the money they put into this. Both the executive branch and the legislative branch need to get real about this and call it what it is um, and put money into it. The business sector, you guys read the news today. You saw what Adidas did about Kanye West. The business sector plays a really important role in the signals that they're sending about what is permissible. Anti-Semitism is not okay. It is not okay. And we have seen the rise of anti-Semitism in our country and around the world, and it is outrageous. I remember in 2007, when I was at the Department of State and I was working in the Europe Bureau, so I was going back and forth to Europe a lot, I kept returning back and telling my colleagues something weird is happening in Europe. Something is shifting. As people who have survived the Holocaust are dying because they're getting older, there's a rise in Holocaust denial. And, we, and this was 2007. And we were, you know, we're skipping along like that's all right, it's not all right. So companies need to understand what we stand for as humans. Do we respect each other? And are we willing to cut the bottom line where it counts with people who think it is okay to be anti-Semitic? Thank goodness Adidas has finally come to the table on this. It took them a few, a few uh, nudges to, to move along. So, so when you ask who's responsible, yes, all of us. But corporate, corporate uh, power is important political and policy power is really important. And then the final piece of this is obviously um, technology, uh, the technology companies. And 
you know, they've been very lazy uh, on hate. They've been extremely lazy on hate. They're, they started out of the gate by saying, Everything that we're building, these platforms are to make the world better, right. you know? And we, we drank that Kool-Aid for a while until we realized, actually, this is affecting the seven-year-old who is killing herself because she's getting algorithms that are showing her a body image that's different than her own. Um, we're seeing online bullying in crazy ways. And then in our sphere of what we're talking about today, we're also seeing bad actors using those platforms and terrible content that's out there that's all right for a long period of time. So these are some of the leaders that need to take shape. And then I want to mention one last piece of this. Um, I will tell you that after 9-11, when I began my work in government, we, we urged and begged and pleaded for philanthropists to get involved in fighting hate. Begged. The biggest foundations in our country, the biggest philanthropies that we all know, I'm not going to name names tonight, the answer from everybody was, this is not our problem, this is terrorism, and that's something government can do. And what we were saying was, we need non-government money to give to nonprofit organizations that are doing the work on the ground because one, they don't want to take USG money because it's tainted in their eyes. And the people that they are working with want to be able to do, they had ideas on what to do, but they couldn't do it because uh, they felt that, that they wouldn't be um, authentic and credible. So we asked foundations, we asked philanthropists, give us the money to, to trial these programs. It wasn't done for a very long time. That period of time was a black hole. And I'm really, as you can tell, angry about it because we missed a golden opportunity to go really big when the, when the, when the, when the problem was manageable. Um, and what we've done, Steve, is the way we do our work is that nonprofit organizations at the grassroots, which is the right step, by the way, it's, it's grassroots organizations that understand their communities better than government, you know, looking down and saying what needs to be done. They are being put on the front line to fight hate and extremism with ideas that are really excellent, but they don't have enough scale. They're putting their people at risk because now they're being followed by hate groups. Some people's lives are at risk that we've asked them to do the hard work of protecting us with programs and we don't give them enough money to keep the, uh, the lights on and the, the staff paid. I think it's outrageous. So when I think about where we are today in this threat, with it being as large as it is and as complex as it is, it is a time for all of us to stand up and say, we want to build a different kind of society. We want one in which we've decreased hate and extremism, so it's not the threat it is today. And we know the way, the levers that have to be pulled to be able to do that. What is the role for academia at Western universities? Well, listen, I, I think one of, the, um, one of the big changes that have happened since 9-11 is all of the research and excellence in, uh, in academia around what's really going on. We need them to be able to help us understand what we're seeing. Because the puzzle that we're pu pulling together can't just come from a, a government that is saying this is what's happening. I want scholars to tell, tell us a little bit about the history. I want social scientists to talk about the human mind and how people get radicalized. I want medical experts to tell me um, what's happening in the brain of a 16-year-old girl versus a 17-year-old, uh, sorry, between a 16-year-old girl and a 16-year-old boy, and what kinds of signals they need to see in society to make them go one way or another. How does hate, nobody's born hating what's actually happening to them. So Academia is really important. It gives us, in many ways, the stability to be able to understand the back end of what we have to build. Um, and, and we have to think differently about the kind of academics. So I mentioned a few categories, but I also want to throw in a couple more. Um, it isn't common to talk about anthropologists and ethnographers when we're looking at radicalization and hate. And they need to be at the table. I want to see people turn, turn things upside down about culture and societies. I want to understand not just about the history 800 years ago, which is, you know, which is impacting, but I want to understand how those nuances in society have shifted so that people are, are responding to the, the, the elements the way they are today. 
So this kind of co cooperation and collaboration is happening in elite places in some, in some pockets, but it's not happening big enough. Um, and, I, and I really feel that this is an opportunity to take a look at ways we can work differently to both in our country and around the world. Uh, I have some experience with having anthropologists uh, at company special forces teams yes. that I was with, and they were incredibly effective. However, there was great dissension in the academic and professional anthropology community about whether this was the right thing to do. And you can see both sides. How do you deal with that? Well, it's the way you dealt with things when you were working in, in, uh, in public service as well. There's a chain of command. You discuss back and forth what works, and, and ultimately somebody makes the, bottom, makes the final decision. But here's the thing about soft power. Nobody's getting killed. <laughs> we're, we're not, I mean, the people who are working on this are not um, you know, uh, fighting a, a physical war. We're fighting an ideological war, lots of different kinds of ideological wars. So testing and piloting different things, there's no harm in doing this. And when I say we need to go all in, I mean going all in at scale and in terms of creativity as well. Um, it isn't like we only have X amount of, of ammunition and only X amount of guns and only X amount of soldiers. Are you kidding me? Like this is the time that we should be flourishing with creativity and innovation and trying new ways of, of thinking about responses from humans. We do this in other sectors. You know, business people who are selling you a widget try a whole bunch of things to try to sell you that widget. This isn't working, so we're gonna try that. That's not working. And they have a lot of cultural intelligence to help nudge people a particular way to buy that pair of sneakers, to think that that kind of salad is the way to go, to lose weight, to, I mean, this just doesn't spontaneously come into your brain. You're seeing signals and culture by people that you respect or ads or whatever that are nudging you in a particular direction. Doesn't cost life to try. And here we are dealing with this threat of, of extremists and hate organizations that want to eradicate life and we, the non-haters and extremists, are sitting back going, well, I guess that's too complicated. I guess we can't do anything. It's absurd. Well, let me ask you then. I think we've got a wonderful group here, and it comes to our organizational events. We, the non-haters, what can we do? Well, first of all, I thank you so much for coming and being interested in this topic. That's one. Um, but two, really think, go back to sort of the what I would call nano interventions. You don't have to boil the ocean. Your job is not to do the, the big response if you don't want to. But you can think about small things you can do in communities that you touch every day that are actually building bridges. And some of the stuff that you're doing is inviting different kinds of people to hear different opinions. I understand that. But I would urge you, if you want to go a step further, to think about what nonprofit organizations in Western Massachusetts are working on issues of fighting hate and extremism and asking them what they need to actually accelerate and, and scale what they're doing. Wonderful. Let me ask you a little bit about, I'm gonna back up, kind of think internationally. The perception of America as a country, which can range from a beacon of light and hope and democracy to an imperialist conquering aggressor. Um, how does that general impression of America play into this generation of hate? Well, listen, um, many Americans have never left our country, and so they don't really think about what others think of them. Um, you know and I know, because we've been lucky enough to serve our nation, we understand that what we stand for in America actually makes a difference to our foreign policy and the way people perceive us, which affects our bottom line. Um, I think that the growth of hate in our country, we have, we're, we, mark my words, we will become sponsors of hate. There will be countries that will go after us the way we go after other countries. Because we, because what's happening in our country is radicalizing people in other parts of the world. Money that is flowing from our country is going to support hate organizations in other parts of the world. Ideology has no borders. So the way we need to think about things is repairing our nation for the good of our nation, for the strength of our nation first. <laughs> And also because we can't be credible. Anywhere in the world, if we talk about issues of pluralism, 
of democracy. I mean, the fact that we are talking about democracy in America today, how is it we're now supposed to go around the world talking about how important democracy is if we can't get our house in order over here? I mean, it's really absurd. On a very tactile issue, um, there are minority groups in our country who have seen a rise of hate in an unprecedented way because of COVID. The Asian American community, for example, um, has suffered greatly um, because of language that was used uh, by the former president and this sort of idea that the blame of COVID is on, on Asian Americans. And when you look at the rise of hate in the AAPI communities, you see that change. So what, how that, I mean, I will tell you, that's really affected the way people are, are, are asking questions about who we are as Americans. You have very successful stories of Americans who talk about our country as if we're integrated and everything's really great. And then you look at, you look at the reality on the ground and we have not done enough to look at what the shape and the form is of hate in our country. Thinking of soft power and diplomatic power and information power and economic power and what you're talking about affecting people's minds and their souls and their beliefs, uh, is there some, at some point there are people you can't reach. I, I think I was very fortunate to get a, a, a master's in international relations at the university in Heidelberg, Germany. And I remember I had two Iranian guys my age in my class and their view of the world, it was an astonishing for me for a kid who grew up in a Western Mass mill town to realize that these guys thought that everybody in America thought about Iran every day. Yeah. And, um, and nothing ever, they never changed and certainly I probably never changed because I didn't think about it. But is there, at some point we just say there's a, a group we can't reach or do we just keep trying? How's that work? Well, there are two, two parts of that question. The first is, um, in general, the general question of wanting people to see America for who we are, the best of who we are, it should never be something we stop doing because this is an amazing country. And we have an experiment that is going on that many countries have, have, have looked up to to see will it work. And it has not been perfect. And we know that. And we have to be honest about our imperfections and our history and not whitewash what, what has been very painful for our nation. So standing up for what we aspire to, for the principles in our constitution, for standing uh, side by side with um, the elements that we all learned growing up is fundamental. And so when you talk to people who would, who would, who would um, look at our country and say, you were never that, that wasn't there. You know, I would say we have an we have a, a opportunity to tell our story of our experience in our country. And I experienced that firsthand after 9-11 as somebody who came to this country as a baby, grew up outside of Boston. Uh, obviously, I'm an American. I'm also a Muslim. I've served my nation. And I was going into communities as a member of the US administration, talking about the fact that I could be an American, and I could be a Muslim, and grow up outside of Boston and never think about that in any different kind of way. Right, right. And that was a powerful message. By the way, that cannot be said today. It's sad. And I will tell, it is sad. And I, I will say firsthand, not because there's, I started off by saying there's been a shift in our country. Um, you know, when you talk about the, the gentleman from Iran who believe that all day, every day, we're thinking about Iran, you know, we are thinking about a lot of things in America, um, and not only Iran, um, but um, what, one of the things we are doing that is different, that they can see too, because they have access to um, what's happening on social media. They're, it's not like we're limited and nobody can see the conversation that's happening in America. Um, I, I was on my book tour in 2019, and people were asking me how I was allowed to serve in the White House if I wasn't an American. Uh, I was being told, I'm not even kidding, it was just mind blowing to me. Um, I, was, I was repeatedly asked, or, or told rather, you speak English really well. And I'd say, well, thank you, that's great. I've worked my whole life to do that. You know, like, why am I, what are you supposed to say? But, so that shift, okay, so that's one part of it. Like, so yes, always talk about who we are, your experience. The second is, on this issue of hate and extremism, 
our job, as wonderful as it might be, to take a magic wand out and eradicate hate from the planet, let's get real, that isn't going to happen. So what's, what is it we're trying to do? The job here is to so decrease those who hate that we can manage it, right? In a way that bombs aren't going off, the Boston Marathon thing isn't happening every other day. There isn't like, can we contain it to a place where it's horrible, but not at the level it is today? And so what I would say, Steve, to that question is, while I would want to work on many different kinds of generations to not hate, the three generations that I am focused on all the time are three. Millennials, Gen Z, and Alpha. Those are the three, because they were the youngest, so from seven to you know, those who were 20, 25, 27, because that's the future of our country. And I want them to actually have the tools that they need to fight the extremist ideology, and I want as, as many antibodies in the system as I can get in so that when the bad guys are trying to recruit, there are defenses in place. I would love to keep talking, but I want to give everybody else a chance. Sure, so, but, but one thing I want to ask you is kind of a wrap up between our conversation is if you have to reinforce one thing that you would want people leaving here tonight to have in mind, what would that be? Is that solutions are available and affordable and not to think it's, it's, it's too overwhelming, it's too hard, it's too emotional, I can't get involved. It takes one person at a time to do this. And I'm not being silly when I say it. I've seen change happen with a group, a small group like this. Say, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna do this and we're gonna try that and we're gonna experiment. It makes a difference. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna have questions now, but thank you for this. I, I have a question. You, 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 know, you talked a little bit about the government spending money on this. And one thing we saw with the January 6th in our own country was how many people that were in the military uh, were ex-military had become radicalized and had started militias. And does the military and the government itself bear a responsibility for this? Or is there more training that needs to be done in terms of cultural sensitivity? I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. So. Well, it's a great question, by the way. I think um, you, you presented the question as if it's, it's one element that deserves the responsibility. And society at large is, as I've tried to explain, helps you think about who you are and, um, and what's permissible. So let's start there. Um, there's a different question, however, in terms of what is happening in the military. And this goes to your question about um, academics and research that's been done. And we have far more data today about what kind of ideologies um, were permissible and OK. Um, and I think today you're seeing Secretary Austin take this issue very seriously. Um, and they're looking at ways to identify those who have been radicalized, but also set in place. It's not just cultural training and education, but also uh, opportunities for um, mental health um, you know, resources, for learning about, we didn't at all talk about digital literacy, and I want to speak about that for a moment. Many people began their process online not understanding how algorithms work. And, you know, there's an open question here about if you don't understand the, 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 the system that is in place, how do you know what it's doing? How do you know why you're always getting um, introduced to people who think like you and believe like you do? And, you know, there's a consciousness part here around um, learning about the tools that you have in your hand, what's being sold to you, what, when you show your face ID, who's seeing that, <laughs> how many people own it, when you touch your fingerprint on like those are things that you as a citizen ought to know, and you can make your choice as to what you do with those things. Um, and so I think that there's a piece that's also on digital literacy because we, we're seeing what's happening in the social media platforms where a lot of this stuff Groups were formed, organizing was taking place, um, and it's a very scary component. I'm glad you brought up the military because they're trained, obviously. Um, so what do you do with those who have been radicalized, who are now using their training and 
uh, for nefarious um, means. So this is like at the top of, I know, the, the thought process in terms of how we think about um, what's happening in the military today. Bear, thank you again for being with us tonight. Um, you spoke a little bit how, on how Holocaust denialism in Germany is on the rise. It seems like there's a relapse on certain items. What tools have we given up to help move social cohesion in the US? And for example, in Massachusetts, we only reintroduced mandatory Holocaust education last year. What, what other tools have we given up, especially in the non-educational area that builds social cohesion? Oh, I love this question. And by the way, in the introduction prior to this, um, to learn that you're a sophomore at Tufts? Yes. Go Jumbos. <laughs> um, I hope that you're gonna look at the Fletcher School at some point. I'm just saying, just saying, okay. Um, tools in the toolbox. One of the, the best NGOs uh, that I know, it's Massachusetts-based, Facing History and Ourselves. You guys are very familiar with it. Um, and the toolkit that they have around teaching about American history, um, about teaching about the Holocaust, about teaching about other cultures, um, is really powerful. So that I'm glad you you raised sort of the the teaching curriculum. But there's also a, a component in terms of former extremists who have gone down the rabbit hole, who have joined. Um, you brought up anti-Semitism, so let's talk about white supremacist groups um, who use um, who use the power of a Holocaust denial and and you know cr you know the the sort of white supremacist mindset to activate a whole host of different things. We have former extremists who have walked down that path and walked away. They're really important assets because they're able to tell people how they got radicalized, what they saw, what they did, and why they left. There is no more credible source than somebody who walked away. That's true for ISIS, that's true for Al-Qaeda, that's true for, like, those people, their narratives are really, really unique and very useful. We haven't utilized them to the best of our capacity. There's some NGOs that have taken their narratives and are using them in curriculums and also on videos and sharing it with students. It's not enough. We need to find different ways to, to activate you know, that, that kind of experience that they're seeing what that is. So one is former extremists to add to your, add to your pile. The other is, um, you know, there are, you know, the State Department does some incredible programs, and I'm not saying state is the only one, I'm just saying this is an example of walking in somebody else's shoes. And I remember an opportunity where the State Department brought some religious leaders who were Muslim to, uh, to, to, to concentration camps. And some of those religious leaders had gone into this trip really not believing that the Holocaust was as bad as it was. Or that, you know, people had made things up. They were the very ones who were on the ground crying when they went to these concentration camps and saw for themselves. So what can we do? We can't bring everybody to the concentration camps to see what happened, but what can we do to make it real for people so that people understand this isn't Hollywood spinning a tail, this isn't, so it is, it is experiential kinds of things that we can, we can think about as well. Um, finally, um, I think that the, the, the most elementary tool that all of us have is our voice and our ability to write. And when you hear somebody who makes the ridiculous joke that says the vile thing that you just don't turn the other way and say, that's okay, that's just them. That you stand up and say something. Because too many of us are willing to say, you know what, okay, fine. You know, it's not fine. That's how hate spreads. And you know, I, 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 we've learned this the hard way, and now we're at a place where we are looking at every tool available to us. The most easy tool that we have right here, right now, is our ability to speak, to write, to act. One of the things that uh, uh, I'm wondering, you talked about children. Yes. And I want to relate, uh, probably 15 years ago, I was working on a project as a prosecutor to look at, at what, was there some age, we didn't know, is there some age where, my God, we need to make, to intercede? And I, I still remember the day, it was a very profound emotional moment, 
when it became clear that if a child can't read at the fourth grade level in fourth grade, you, this was males we were looking at, you can pencil that kid in for state prison because that's when they go from learning to read to reading to learn. From what you've studied, is there a similar breakpoint that young at, uh, on the hate? Yeah, so I think scholars are, are, um, have different opinions on, on this, but I will say, I talked about what's happening in the home, and I think children at a very, very early age are picking up um, language that their parents use or whoever's raising them, um, what they seem is permissible, slang, jokes, that kind of thing that you think that the kid is not understanding, that translates into the classroom, that goes forward. So I would say um, when a child is able to comprehend language um, and the kinds of, the kinds of tone, um, the whispers of a parent, what they say, are they whispering a, a different race or are they saying it out loud normally? Are they talking about a different a religion with a different tone or are they talking about it normally? Um, are they inviting people into their homes that are of different faiths and of different um, ethnic backgrounds? Do they see that in their daily life? Um, those are signals that a child gets at a very young age to understand what, what values that they place inside of themselves. All right, I'm getting a signal from Sid, so, but with that question and that answer, please tell us there's hope. I do believe that there's hope, and I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing if I thought you know, there's, there's no way out. Um, what I'm, you, you, the frustration you hear is because there is hope. <laughs> the frustration is because the solutions are right here and we're not scaling it. And it, and it, makes, me, um, it, it makes me frustrated because I know that there are so many people like all of you who want to see change in our country and around the world. Um, so there is hope and there is, there's a growing consensus that uh, there's opportunity awaiting uh, all of us if we think a little bit differently and inject into our society the things that we've spent the last hour talking about. So I want you to be hopeful, but I also want you to act. Thank you. Thank you so much. You love me.